This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. Thank you so much for joining us in this lesson on prayer. I'm sure that you're well aware of the fact that our founding fathers, that is those who were the founders of the United States of America, were individuals that found prayer to be very, very important. And yet there are so many today who want to take that away from us, such as the ACLU. There are others that do not see the importance of prayer. They don't even like for people to pray, and they certainly don't want people to pray publicly. But Christians must be a people of prayer. And we, like Daniel, must never allow anyone to take our prayers away from us. We're weak when we do not pray regularly. We cannot have a strong faith and a mature faith if we are not frequently going to God in prayer. Let's talk for just a moment about the persistence in prayer and the importance of being persistent. Let's talk about the peace that comes through prayer and we'll talk a little bit then about our posture in prayer. One thing I want us to understand about persistence in prayer is that persistence is not the same as vain repetitions. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 7, Jesus Christ warned His disciples against the use of vain repetitions in prayer. The word vain here comes from a word that means to babble and to make the same sounds over and over again. We're to avoid that kind of prayer. But praying the same thing on more than one occasion is not vain repetitions. Jesus Christ repeated His prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, Matthew chapter 26 and verse 44. Surely then the repetition of prayers is not the same as vain repetitions. When one prays from the heart, prays from a sincere desire, from a sincere need, he's not praying vain repetitions, even if he prays the same prayer on more than one occasion. H. Leo Bowles said, Christians should be careful to restrict the use of their words in prayer and should use great simplicity and not high-sounding phraseology. Sometimes when Christians get involved in high-sounding phraseology, they begin to repeat phrases that they think sound really good, sound really clever, and sound really intelligent. That's not the way we are to pray. Every prayer, whether public or private, needs to come from the heart. And you need to be thinking about what you're saying as you're praying that prayer. But persistent prayer is important. In fact, persistent prayer is even commanded. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 16 through 18. There's joy in our faith, and with that joy and with that thanksgiving, let us pray without ceasing. Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 through 4 is similar, where in verse 2 it is mentioned that prayer is to be made on a frequent basis. Let's be persistent in our prayer. Persistent prayer is, in fact, effective. I want us to look at Luke chapter 18 for just a moment. Luke chapter 18, and we're going to read verses 1 through 8. This is a parable given by Jesus Christ, which is given for the express purpose of showing us that men ought always to pray and not to lose heart. Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 1. Then he spoke a parable to them, that men ought always to pray and not lose heart, saying, There was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard men. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him, saying, Get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Do I not, do not fear God nor regard man? Yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her lest by her continual coming she weary me. Now, you don't want to put too much into all of that other than the purpose that Jesus Christ said that parable intended to convey, which is this, men always ought to pray and not lose heart. And so you and I need to pray often. And there's nothing wrong with praying for the same thing over and over again. We just don't want to use vain repetitions. Paul was persistent in his prayers, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 9, and we should be the same way. Now let's talk for just a moment about the peace 
that comes through prayer. Prayer is very important to us from a spiritual standpoint and an emotional standpoint. We understand that if we do not have friends to speak to, we have God to speak to. If we do not have family to speak to, we have God to speak to. If we do not have brethren around us to speak to, we have God to speak to, and that's not a last resort. Even when we have all the support that we need from family and friends and from the church, we still need to speak to God. And in speaking to God, we are going to have a peace that comes within us because we completely trust in God and we have given our problems over to Him. Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. In this context, Paul is talking about a number of different things. He speaks of some women that were having problems in the church there and he wants them to be helped so they'll be of the same mind. He talks about those that were working with him. And then he makes this statement in verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. There is great joy in Christianity for a number of reasons, but that joy is most certainly, at least in part, tied to our opportunities and ability to pray to God. He says, Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. On through the verse 8 there, he talks about the fact that we are dwelling upon those things that are good and pure. We do that when we pray. Verse 9, he says, The things which you've learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Well, the things you learn from Paul include praying and praying frequently. And when you have that, the peace of God is with you. When you have that, verse 7, you'll have the peace of God inside of you that passes all understanding. Give your thoughts, your cares, and your worries to God in prayer, and you will have a peace that nobody else who will be able to understand. Here's part of the reason we can have such peace, and this is tied to the fact that Christians are sometimes going to sin. Do not use that as an excuse to sin. Romans chapter 6 and verse 1, never use the grace of God as an excuse to sin. Always be striving for perfection. Always be striving to be that individual that defeats the devil when the devil comes to tempt him. And yet, there may, on occasion, be times when we do sin against God. When we sin against God, we're going to have, if we're in a right relationship with God, the guilt inside of us, or at least if we understand God in the Scriptures, if we have a good conscience, we'll have that guilt inside of us. We'll have that remorse and that regret. And that's going to lead us to repent. And that's going to lead us to confess our sins to God and ask God to forgiveness. And so in 1 John chapter 1, as John speaks concerning the fellowship that we have with God, that fellowship continues as we walk in the light. And as we walk in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ continues to cleanse us from our sins. Tied in with that, though, verse 9, is the fact that we are continuing to confess our sins. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Going on through chapter 2 and verse 2, we see that we are able to go to God in prayer with confidence in Him and confidence in our advocate, Jesus Christ, because He is there for us when we do sin. But look at the promise made here. If we will go to God in prayer concerning our sin and confess our sins to God, the Bible says He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. There's confidence in God, in His grace, in His mercy, in His love, and in His kindness that forgiveness will be ours. That brings peace. We don't need to be such individuals who are forgiven by God and yet who cannot forgive themselves. Understand that when you pray for forgiveness, God has indeed fulfilled that prayer. God has indeed forgiven you, and that can bring great peace to your heart your soul, your mind. Let's talk for just a moment about posture in prayer. I think most of us probably understand that no particular posture is bound in prayer. Most often what you see in the church 
are individuals who will bow their heads out of reverence and respect for God and then close their eyes, perhaps so that they can focus on the prayer that's being said and, and maybe so that they are not distracted by the things around them. This particular posture in prayer is good and most certainly has its benefits, but it is not bound by God. Here are some examples of posture in prayer. In Matthew chapter 26 and verse 39, you see Jesus Christ praying face down. That is one particular posture in prayer. And you can certainly pray to God that way and in so doing show your humility. We also show humility to God when we get down on our knees, Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 14. And it may be the case that physically it might not be a good idea for you to get down on your knees. You don't have to do that to pray. But it is an excellent posture in prayer. It indicates our humility before God. In Luke chapter 18, verses 9 to 13, you have the parable given by Jesus Christ concerning two individuals that prayed. One was a Pharisee and the other was a tax collector. The Pharisee prayed in an arrogant way and his prayer was not well received. The tax collector, however, showed great humility in his prayer and therefore his prayer was well received. But you may know that he was standing even as he looked down and he beat on his chest and prayed unto God. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8 talks about lifting holy hands in prayer. And so there are occasions at least in the first century where individuals would hold up their hands as they prayed unto God. And that was a sign of respect and a sign of pleading unto God, indicating that we need God to hear our prayers and answer them. Now let's talk for just a moment about the head covering as we consider posture in prayer. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 1 through 16. We want to be very careful what we say about the head covering. Most certainly it is the case that if individuals' consciences are bothered by not having their heads covered when they worship God, they should cover their heads. However, it is wrong to bind the head covering on women in worship today. And I'm going to show you why that is the case. Open up your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and we're going to note some very, very important principles and commands given here. And let's see the context. Let's see what God is saying, and let's try to take out some of the words that were added by translators. There are not very many good translations of this passage. In fact, I found the best translation of this passage to be the King James Version because it adds few words. I found the worst translation of this passage to be the Revised Standard Version because it changes the word in there, puts the word veil in there in its place, and the word veil is not anywhere in the context. It's not in verse 10 where the Revised Standard Version translators put it. So there's good translations of this and bad, but none of them convey the text as well as does the King James. Now, let's look at the text, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 3. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Now here is a creation principle. This principle goes back to the beginning of time, goes back to the Garden of Eden, and that is this, that man has authority over the woman. Now there have been some that have said that the creation principle is that a man, or that a woman I should say, should have her head covered every time she prays. But you see no such commands given to Eve. You don't see God making a covering for her head when He made a covering for the rest of her. You don't see commands given to others in the Old Testament to, to cover their heads in prayer to God. It's not a creation principle. What is a creation principle is the fact that man has authority over the woman. Exodus chapter 28 and verse 4 and Exodus chapter 28 verses 37 to 41 show us that the priests under the law of Moses were required to cover their heads when they worshiped God. The high priest wore a turban and the priest wore some type of hat as they led the Jews in worship to God. Now in this context of 1 Corinthians 11, it says the man is to have his head uncovered and the woman covered. But in Exodus, the man who's leading the worship there must have his head covered 
It's the exact opposite. Well, what does that tell you? It tells you that the principle of a man being uncovered in prayer and a woman being covered is not a creation principle. It does not go back to the beginning of time. In fact, the woman wearing a head covering, as the context shows us, is a matter of her authority, is a matter of her right, is a matter of her choosing, her freedom, or her liberty. The Greek word that is used here is the word exousia. 1 Corinthians 11.10 says, For this reason the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Now I'm reading out of the New King James Version, which is my preferred translation, but it is not a good translation in this verse because they add too many words. They add the words, a symbol of. Those words are not in the text. It doesn't really say, for this reason the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head. It really says the woman ought to have authority on her own head. What's the reason? The reason is because of the angels. Now, how is this word authority or right or liberty, exousia in the Greek, used in the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 7 through chapter 11? That's the bigger context. This word exousia, meaning right, liberty, and authority, is used in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, talking about the marriage relationship, the Bible tells us that the man does not have exousia or liberty or authority over his body, but rather his wife has that authority over his body, and then it's reversed. We understand what that word means in 1 Corinthians 7. It means you don't have the liberty to withhold from your spouse. That's what's being said there. The same word is used again in the very next chapter. This time we're told we do have exousia or liberty or the authority to choose whether or not we want to eat meat. That word exousia is used in that context. You have the liberty. You have the right to eat the meat. There's nothing actually wrong with eating the meat that had been offered unto idols. But Paul recommends that in the context, or Paul says in the context where it's going to offend a brother, don't eat it. So you have liberty to eat it. You have the right to choose, but it's going to offend a brother. Don't do it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, the Apostle Paul uses the Greek word exousia again, talking about liberty, authority, right. He says preachers have the right or the liberty or the authority to choose whether or not they will receive money from the church for their preaching. He says in this particular instance, on that particular occasion, that he chose not to use that authority or right to receive money from the church while he was there in Corinth. So it's okay to do it, but he thought it best not to do it in that circumstance. Do you see the pattern? Chapter 8, so re okay really to eat the meat, but it's best not to do it. Chapter 9, it's okay to receive money for preaching, but in that particular instance, it was best not to do it. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 talks about the liberty with regard to the meat again. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 10 then talks about the head covering. And in that context, the Apostle Paul uses the Greek word exousia, meaning that the woman has the right to choose whether or not she will cover. She has the liberty to choose whether or not she will cover. She has that authority over her own head to choose whether or not she will cover. But in the context there, you see the Apostle Paul is saying, it's best in this situation that she go ahead and cover. So we ought not bind that. In fact, we only want to encourage women to do that if the particular culture in which they're living encourages that particular practice as an evidence of submission to the man. Otherwise, don't press it, don't push it, don't bind it, because when you do, you are binding where God has not bound. Some have said in that context, though, doesn't it talk about nature? And uh, verse 14, does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it's a dishonor to him? But if a woman has long hair, it's a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. Now, the hair is not the covering that is mainly being considered in the context, verse 6. Otherwise, you would have a situation where God is telling women, if you don't have hair on your head as a covering, then you might as well be shaven, and, and that doesn't make any sense. But he's using this as an illustration. He's saying, doesn't nature say that it's, it's not good for a man to have long hair, but it's good for a woman to have long hair? Well, let's think about the use of this word nature. 
This word nature is used in different ways in the Bible. One of the ways in which this word nature can be used is to indicate something which is inherent within God's natural design. Is it inherent within God's natural design that a man cannot have long hair? Well, obviously not, because if a man doesn't cut his hair, his hair is going to get long. So that cannot be the use of the word here. This is not saying that it's natural within God's creation that a woman wear a head covering. That's not at all what it's saying. There's another use of the word nature, and that is that there's something inside of us that God has put within us so that we in intrinsically know we shouldn't be doing this. So would God then put inside of men the idea that they should never have long hair and then command Samson to have long hair and then command the Nazarites to have long hair? There are faithful men of God in the Bible that had long hair. And so this is certainly not the use of the word either. However, the word nature can be used, as it is in the book of Ephesians, to refer to that which has become a part of our culture by long-standing habit. By our habits, we see that this is a certain thing that we want to do. And so the habit of the culture of that day was women showing their respect for the authority of men by having their heads covered. And so Paul says, it's your right to choose, it's your liberty, exousia, verse 10, but it's best, considering the nature of the culture, that you go ahead and cover your heads. So as we're talking about posture in prayer, let's make sure we don't bind where God is not bound. God has not bound the head covering on women today. Neither has God bound any particular posture in prayer. We've talked about the importance of being persistent in prayer. Being persistent in prayer is not the same as being vain in your repetitions. We talked about the peace that comes inside of us from our prayers unto God. And there's no other way you're going to receive that kind of peace that comes from that trust in God and knowing that He's going to help you with your problems. And we've talked about posture in prayer to God and of the fact that no particular posture must be bound. Thank you so much for joining us for this lesson on the subject of prayer. We hope that as you open up the Scriptures, it is a benefit to you and that you will grow and mature in your ability to pray unto God and that prayer will become a vital part of your life that will strengthen and encourage you day in and day out. Thank you so much for joining us. God bless you.